Marcus Malone, is there any publicly available reason as to why the manga is behind the anime for Dragon Ball Super? I think it's just Toyotaro is having to do it monthly, and he can't really keep up with the series, I, I guess. I mean, he has his set ways of doing things with Toriyama, and, you know, um, yeah, um, that's the only real reason I can think of, just the anime caught up, and they're going to have to do a lot of filler to allow Toyotaro to catch up, which they're not going to do. They're moving forward with the next arc. So, I mean, we already had, like, what, seven weeks of filler from December to January? So, at this point, man, it's probably going to stay behind for a little while. Took a little sip there. All right, a couple more, and then we're going to get out of here. Do you think it's possible for Half Saiyan Race to transform into God Mode? Um... I've already talked about this. I think that Super Saiyan Rage is that. But that's my theory, okay? I don't want people going around saying it's a fact. That's my theory. Uh, do you think Super Saiyan Rage is equal to God Mode form? I think it's close to it, yeah. I actually do think so, because Trunks is doing really, really well. Really, really well. But again, that's my theory. We don't have enough information. Javier Ikari, or maybe Xavier, whatever Four, you want. I, Javier is a Spanish way of saying two, it. Can you do a one. video on the original color schemes about how some of the villains would have looked like? For example, I think you mentioned in one of your visits that Janemba was originally supposed to be blue, but they changed it. Yes. Um, yes, Janemba was originally like blue and gray. Um, I'm, I wasn't going to do a video on the color schemes of the villains. I was going to do a video about um, like original concepts that were never used. Or like rare images. I was gonna do that, but um, I'm still gonna do it. It's just a matter of getting it done. I had a big, big series planned for last year and this year, and I haven't got to it yet. And I kind of hope that I can get to it soon um, because it's, it's like a massive series for the channel. I just had to, like, I just had surgery, so I'm kind of trying to take it easy this month. To be honest with you, I have a lot of videos, coming, but. I need to rest also. I need to rest. You know what I'm saying? Like right now, I'm actually in a little bit of pain. I'm still doing the Q&A. So uh, those videos are coming. They are coming. It's just a matter of me getting them done. Heroes, and they will be done. I mean, without question. I got a bunch of big videos planned for this I hope you're ready. year. Mason Nelson. That's a cool fucking name, bro. If Boob is introduced after the Universal Tournament, uh, will Gohan even need a train when we have Goku, Vegeta, and the reincarnation of Boo? They don't really need him at that point, do they? <laughs> so I agree. Pedro Mascoro, who do you think will give a better fight in the universe of Tian, Krillin, or Roshi? I'm hoping for Roshi. It'll probably be Krillin, but I'm hoping for Roshi because I want to see him take more ass. Mike Lewis, do you think Kaba would have achieved SS2 in the new arc? I would write him to achieve SS2, yes, um, but uh, I don't think he will. Jacob Zane Thomas, what's the strongest technique in the Dragon Ball franchise? Somebody, <laughs> Zeno Far. Actually, that's. Brandon's right. Like, the strongest technique in the whole Dragon Ball Saga franchise is Zen Zeno blowing up the 12 universes. I mean, come on now. <laughs> Fuck that. Uh, let's see here. What would your parents say if you brought a black girl home? Come on, bro. That's a stupid question. Uh, Bella Virage. Tell, tell me all your thoughts about the new arc. Like, the red arc, Goku, Gohan, Goku. I did a whole video covering my predictions, brother, on the channel. It's on the, the, in, the Intro 2 Breakdown channel. Go check that out. Uh, will Vegeta be the guy to save the day finally in Dragon Ball Super? I certainly hope so. I mean, I hope. I think his time has come. Josh, all right, I'm going to ask you to answer two more. Uh, what is your opinion on the state of this country with Trump as president? I'm not answering that, brother. I'm getting into politics. Is it true Toriyama hates Vegeta? I already covered that on my channel. Go to the Talk Dragon Ball playlist and look up does Toriyama really hate Vegeta, and you'll see that video. David Garcia, what anime would you like Dragon Ball to have a crossover with? Not a two-episode special like One Piece, Thorco, but like a complete saga. Um, Dr. Slump, I wouldn't mind it. Uh, one Punch Man, I think, would be my number one pick. That's my number one pick. Um, Colin Farrar, do you think all the universes share the same heaven and hell? I don't think they do. I think they have their own heaven and hell. Matthew Blimline, uh, always assume transformations happen once in every race. I know your opinion is that more technique and mysterious. Uh, it depends on transformation, bro. Uh, that's... I think it totally depends on what it is, because, like, Majin Buu transformed when he absorbed people. Cell absorbed, transformed transform when he absorbed people. Frieza did it to conserve energy, so... It depends on transformation. Last question. Will Tien reach enlightenment and be at God level? Problem. Uh, actually, uh... Hold on. Mel Hennessy Bautista says, can you shout me out? Well, you're in the video, brother, so here's your shout-out. 
Shout out to Mel Hennessy Bautista or Bautista, whatever. I don't usually do shout outs, but he's in the video, so whatever. Daniel Fountain, do you think during the team fighting, surely 17 team will team, but the incorporation technique of some sort of fusion like Super 18? I don't think we're going to see a fusion, but we are going to see some good, bad, badass double team techniques. I think fusion is still going to be banned from the tournament. Anyways, thank you so very much for watching my 1,000th video Q&A. Thanks so much. Of course, Facebook.com slash Geekdom101. Subscribe to Geekdom101 if you have not. Punch that like button. More to come in the future. I'll talk to you all down the road. And thank you so much for being here for 1,000 videos. And I know most of you haven't seen all 1,000 of them, but... Even if you've seen one, I appreciate it. Talk to y'all later. Tell the others of the victory Your I have won. Your enemy has spawned here. a terror. Interesting. Your fort has been destroyed. Careful. My plans are run. Of my own. Keep at it. I'll be back in a minute. Well done. Your enemy's terror has withered away. That gives me an idea. Night comes, heroes. Remember, kill the shamblers and claim their seat.
It is time to harvest. Bring my terror to life. <sighs> the dawn has come, heroes. And with it, my children must rest. There, your terror has come to life. Use it to harvest your enemy's corpses. Let's cut through. I hate to say it, but your enemy has spawned a terror. That gives me an idea. Yeah, that'll cause some damage. And uh, here we have a wild Paul. Oh, hello. Hello, Paul. Hi, gamers, Nexus <laughs> viewers. You're all good people. You're smart. Discerning. Well said. I'm just trying you're to not as smart as Steven, you never will be, so stop even trying. <laughs> I'm sick of it. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Ask GN. You can post your questions for next week's episode in the comment section below. There were a lot of really good questions last week, so I'm going to get through as many as I can today. We've got a two-sheeter today. And you may have also seen the quick Paul and Kyle pre-roll for this video. We were with them at an event along with Jay, Cheesy Perspective, yeah. Legit Reviews, Hot Hardware, a couple of other people uh, for some new products that we'll be talking about later this week, so stay tuned for that. Before getting to the questions for this week, this coverage is brought to you by Catalyst Energy Mints. A three-pack of Catalyst contains the equivalent energy of over 21 energy drinks, and it's 20 bucks, so it's a bit more portable and more affordable as well. You can use code GAMERSNEXUS for 5% off at the link in the description below. So let's get to the questions for this week. The first one we've got is from Lunchbox, who said, I have another question, Steve. Could you explain temporal filtering? I know Watch Dogs 2 uses it, and I hear that PS4 uses it, and Xbox Scorpio uses it, but I don't fully understand what it does. And that explains just about every graphic setting that has ever come out. Uh, even when you understand what it normally, what these things normally do, it tends to change from game to game because developers have different definitions and they have different execution of the technology. For these titles, for Watch Dogs and for previously Rainbow Six Siege, which sort of introduced this version of temporal filtering, uh, I've got some information for you. The basics are that with Rainbow Six Siege, temporal filtering, as it does with Watch Dogs, was supposed to improve your performance and it does so at the cost of some graphics qualities, which is normally how it goes. That temporal filtering is also not the same as temporal anti-aliasing. Temporal anti-aliasing, I think we've talked about in the past in articles on the site, but uh, the very basis of it, temporal anti-aliasing goes frame to frame. Whenever you see the word temporal, it means over time. And in games, that often means frame A to frame B, some kind of algorithm or number crunching happens where it looks at each frame and says, what is the change between whatever I'm doing and let's just cut out anything that's not changed because that can save processing time. It's the same idea as with delta color compression at a very top level where you have two frames. Frame one has a whole bunch of colors. Frame two has a whole bunch of colors in the same space except for maybe uh, however many, a couple hundred thousand pixels or something like that. And that would be the things you would change so you don't need to change the rest and save some processing time. With temporal filtering, what they're doing is the way that Let's go the way Rainbow Six Siege does it first. They rendered the game at half of the target resolution. So if your target's 1080, it renders at half of that from the engine side. It comes out of the engine rendered at half that resolution and comes out to your screen at 1080. But before that happens, before you see the image, there is an applied two-tap multi-sample anti-aliasing to the, to the frame. So two-tap means 2x, so 2x MSAA, and what that means is it's taking two samples per pixel. It's just anti-aliasing like normally, uh, but right. basically they're rendering a lower resolution than smoothing it. So the idea is better performance, and in theory, not that bad quality reduction. With Rainbow Six Siege, it didn't quite work that way. There was actually a lot of quality reduction, primarily in really fine geometry or primitives in the scene. Right. You kind of lose some quality in small triangles and things like that, polys. 
Uh, and in Watch Dogs 2, if you look at it carefully, there's not as much quality loss. They're still pulling the same trick for performance gain, but the there's some loss if you look really closely at self-shaded objects, things like the plants. If you look at the contrast in those types of surfaces, sleep. there's some loss in the ambient occlusion in some areas of the game, and that would be more shading, shadowing, stuff like that. Uh, and there's a little bit of loss, a little bit of aliasing introduced, and a little bit of loss in uh, in other sort of uh, minor qualities, shadows, stuff like that. Uh, but that's the idea, is it's supposed to so reduce the amount of work required to render the scene by rendering at a lower resolution out of the engine and sort of upscaling it to what your monitor sees uh, with some kind of multi-tap and the aliasing applied to smooth things out. That's the idea. And the fact that it's temporal means that it normally looks better in action than in a side-by-side -side comparison, which is really the only good way to demonstrate it in screenshots online. So it's one of those things you have to try it for yourself. I generally don't like it, but with Watch Dogs 2, it's not as noticeable as normally. That's Next question, Crimson Sunrise asks, Steve, if USB is so fast and kick-ass as many factors keep saying and advertising on game peripherals, I feel like we're back in USB 1.0 or something. Uh, why even high-end enthusiast motherboards have at least one PS2 connector? It sure can't be for legacy, as no enthusiast would be caught dead using a PS2 keyboard or mouse, even though the first version of the Steel Series 7G was PS2. Uh, could it be that PS2 is still faster because it's CPU interrupt as opposed to a polling-based solution? Uh, it is interrupt, that's correct. I think the, the I haven't asked any motherboard vendors recently. I used to ask this, I probably asked this at CES 2014. And generally the answer to this type of question, uh, maybe the less obvious answer is for a lot of these older or legacy technologies, they are on the boards like serial and com ports or combo ports, things like that, because uh, in Asia, there's still a lot of use of devices that are enabled by those older interfaces and Asia is a large part of the market. So that's always one of the lesser considered reasons to keep old technologies and interfaces around. The other one would be, you may have noticed if you work with a lot of systems that some systems have trouble detecting input devices when they're not in those first two USB ports up at the very top of the IO during a normal motherboard orientation. And, uh, and you've got to plug stuff in there to be detected on some boards because there's just trouble in BIOS otherwise. I think some of it goes back to that, that where you well know that PS2 will always work. You can plug a, plug a PS2 device in, and if you're just working with BIOS or some legacy software task, you know it's going to work. So I, I really do think it comes down to probably reliability uh, and then probably some supporting developing markets where they still use PS2 and things like that. Now, there may be a, a, a different take on that answer this year, but in 2014, that's kind of what it was when I asked. Next question, Dan Wren says, Steve, can you tell my bosses for video editing we need newer computers that aren't 2011 iMacs with i3s? They're so blind to the fact that these old iMacs are complete shit, it takes two minutes to open Premiere Pro. Uh, so I, um, I don't know that I can tell your bosses directly, but I will say that from a, a business management perspective, Maybe just showing them some benchmark numbers. Uh, Puget Systems has some great benchmark numbers on Premiere. I trust their numbers. Every time I've seen them, they've looked good and we've validated on one or two occasions. But we've done some of our own numbers as well. It's not that many with Premiere. Uh, but they've got good numbers that can probably help back you up. And I think the argument to be made would be, if it takes me two minutes to open Premiere and then however long to render, uh, I, uh, and I can use the system to do other things in that time, then obviously there's a cost benefit if they invest in the system because then they don't have to pay you as many hours to sit there and stare at it. So assuming you're hourly, that would kind of be the way to argue. Next question is from SSS. Says, Steve, for gaming, what is the best method to determine it is time to upgrade your CPU and motherboard? This will vary based on application, but in a broad sense, how can you determine CPU and MOBO if it's holding the performance back? This is kind of a harder question. I think uh, the way we do it's pretty easy. We've got all the hardware, so you just switch them and blooms. done. No problem. Now, if you don't have all that stuff lying around, which you probably wouldn't for a normal situation, 
probably the best thing to do, I would start by looking at benchmarks just to see if anyone's done the homework for you. Look up benchmarks, and what you want to do is look up a CPU benchmark for your CPU, and look up a GPU benchmark for your GPU, and here's a pro tip, because of the way Google works and the way editors title their articles, you may want to look for a recent game rather than an overall benchmark of the product. So if Watch Dogs 2 just came out or something, and you might probably want to look at a few different games, but Watch Dogs 2, For Honor, stuff like that. Look up the benchmarks for those specific games for CPU and GPU, and then get those numbers because they're going to be brand new, uh, and that will help you figure it out. Now, if you don't want to go that route, you could play around with benchmarking yourself by picking a title that you know for sure is either CPU or GPU bound, and then play around with the settings until you can create a bottleneck on the other component. Watch Dogs 2, again, just because it's kind of in my head lately, is a great example of a game that is thread bound primarily and sort of clock limited on the CPU. Not really GPU limited until you start getting to i7 territory. Uh, so if you use something like that, you know you're creating a CPU bottleneck and you can see where does your GPU perform and then you still probably want to look up a, a benchmark for that card that someone else hopefully has conducted. We've got a lot of them. Uh, and you can see where it can perform with something like an i7. That would give you an idea, a baseline. That's probably where I'd start. Now, other things, of course, aged architectures mean you normally have aged I.O. as well. So if you want NVMe or something, it almost doesn't matter what the performance difference is elsewhere in the system if that's all you care about because you won't get that on something like Sandy Bridge. Uh, so that's something to consider as well. But basically benchmarking. You create a scenario where you know one component for sure is bottlenecked because you understand the game or someone else has explained it to you. And, uh, and then you should know how much you're choking on that component, whatever it is. Next question, Kroner Gaming that says, hey Steve, what is the maximum voltage for everyday using on Skylake? Thank you and keep up.